Chapter 2 The Plantation The Dilemma of Physical Bondage Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Exodus chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 Copthorne Commons, Sussex, England, December 10th, 1810, 2.40 p.m. Tom Molyneux cursed under his breath and shivered as he made his way toward the scales for a pre-fight weigh-in. Under normal conditions, Molyneux enjoyed these events. They gave free rein to his flair for drama. They allowed him to connect with the crowd and absorb the atmosphere of the moment. But these were hardly normal conditions. Strong, gusting winds, bitter cold, and slicing rain this December afternoon had washed away the moment. This was a day for neither beast nor man to wage a fight, especially not a fight of this magnitude. Molyneux, the impetuous black American challenger and former slave, versus Tom Cribb, the undisputed, unrivaled champion of England. Molyneux grumbled half-heartedly to Bill Richmond, his manager, sponsor, and tactical guru. Why not postpone the fight until a day when the weather isn't so harsh? But Richmond knew the mere hint of a postponement could trigger a riot. The British people were known throughout Europe for their rowdiness. 18th century Britain was a flurry of riots brought on by everything from bread prices to new machinery. Even now there was internal agitation in England caused by the rise of a radical working class. In an odd way, Molyneux, with his background in American slavery, had become the inspirational symbol of England's working class, which was largely sympathetic to the black resistance in America. The 5,000 fans who stood ankle-deep in mud at Copthorne Commons had no idea they were witnessing the beginning of a historic timeline of the African-American presence on the large stage of professional sport. To them, this was the fight of the century, but in reality, it was merely the first act of a long-running drama that would play itself out back in America for the next two centuries. Even as the United States grew in global stature, the extremely visible struggle of black athletes for a fair opportunity became a constant, often haunting reminder that the principles of liberty and fair play on which the nation was built were compromised. Even if they didn't know about the struggle to come, the crowd that day knew that this fight was more than just a physical struggle. There was something else at stake. For all these reasons, plus the sheer carnal pleasure of a championship fight, there would be no cancellation. Most of the crowd had come from London, almost 25 miles away, to see this bold black phenomenon named Molyneux, this foreigner, mysterious in so many ways, who came to England from a plantation in the American South. While historians agree Molyneux existed and was an accomplished fighter, there is disagreement over Molyneux's account of his slave origins. Molyneux had barreled into London earlier in the year, loud and raucous, proclaiming himself the boxing champion of the United States. To the amazement, disgust, and fascination of Britons, this black Yankee boasted and bragged and told London journalists what he would do to English champion Tom Cribb if ever granted the opportunity. Cribb, for his part, had defeated all challengers in London. Unchallenged, he had retired and gone into the coal business. Then Molyneux came along. His looks, manner, and brash attitude stirred a fever that spread through London. The retired champion at first rebuffed Molyneux, at one point disparaging him as a mahogany imposter. But after he'd heard enough from Molyneux, Cribb sent word to the challenger that before he would consider a championship fight, Molyneux would first have to fight a pair of tune-up matches against opponents hand-picked by the champion. Then and only then, Cribb said, would he decide whether Molyneux was worthy to share the same ring with a national hero.
Molyneux accepted the terms and promptly wiped out the first challenger, a fighter called the Bristol Unknown, in 30 minutes. Next came Tom Tough Blake, a hard-nosed veteran. Molyneux, in an extraordinary display of unpolished power, knocked Blake senseless in eight brutal rounds. The victory over Blake was so stunning that there was now a hue and a cry throughout London for a Molyneux-Crib match, and Crib was forced to acknowledge that the black American was his chief contender. The stage was set. Under British boxing custom, Crib would have to surrender his title if he refused to fight a legitimate challenger. At the same time, he was duty-bound to prevent the championship of England from being held by a foreigner, or worse, as one English writer called Molyneux, a moor. This fight had become larger than Cribb. For the first time in Cribb's career, and the first time in recent English boxing history, a boxing match carried implications for the entire country. Even while sympathetic to the claims of enslaved American blacks, the English were in no hurry to see one take their boxing crown. Born in Virginia, Molyneux was a product of the American plantation system. His father had been a fighter and a sailor in the War for Independence. Molyneux's uncles were fighters as well. When his father died, Molyneux, still enslaved, became an apprentice cabinet maker. He began fighting slaves from other plantations and won several bets for his plantation owner. Algernon Molyneux According to one story, Algernon Molyneux received a challenge from Peyton Randolph, a local planter who said his best fighter could beat Algernon's best. Tom either volunteered or was volunteered to accept the challenge. Algernon supposedly hired a British sailor named Davis to whip Molyneux into shape, literally. Algernon had Molyneux flogged when the sailor complained that Molyneux wasn't training hard enough. It was Davis who told Molyneux of the thriving professional boxing culture in England, of the money he could make with his fist in London. When the slave fight came, Molyneux handily defeated his opponent and won a substantial amount of money for his owner, who, as a reward, set Molyneux free and gave him $500. Molyneux worked his way north, first to Baltimore, then to Philadelphia, and finally to New York, where he lived for five years. According to one account of his life during this period, Molyneux fought several bouts, and in 1809, quote, we find the black assuming the title of champion of America, and he would appear to be the first man to call himself such, end quote. After a string of triumphs, Molyneux took work on a frigate bound for England. He landed in Bristol, walked to London, and was directed to Bill Richmond, a fellow African-American and a top boxing trainer. If Molyneux was the root of a black presence, Richmond was the very seed. Born in Staten Island, New York in 1763, Richmond had come to London in 1777, more than three decades before his protege. Richmond was brought to England as a servant to General Earl Perry, who saw to it that Richmond was given a solid education. In fact, he became better educated than most native-born Englishmen. He attended school in Yorkshire and was apprenticed to a cabinet maker. Somewhere along the line, Richmond was introduced to England's bustling, well-developed sporting culture. He discovered that some men made enough money from their skill with a cricket bat, in the saddle, or with their fist to live comfortably. The United States would not develop a broad-based, commercialized sporting culture for nearly a century. Richmond learned to play cricket and attended horse races and prize fights. One evening, he saw a match between a pair of 50-year-old fighters. What made the greatest impression on Richmond was that one fighter quit after three rounds and still earned four pounds for his effort. Richmond decided to become a fighter on the spot and soon earned a reputation as a skilled one. During his days in the ring, he himself fought Cribb when Cribb was an up-and-coming fighter with a growing reputation. Cribb battered Richmond so badly that Richmond decided to retire 
to the life of a fighter's trainer. Richmond married well. He married a white English woman with enough money to enable him to keep a fashionable house dubbed the Horse and Dolphin. It was here that Richmond opened a boxing school and taught gentry and aspiring boxers the quote-unquote sweet science of boxing. It was at the Horse and Dolphin that he also met Molyneux, who had heard of Richmond's reputation and sought him out. Thirty-two years had passed between Richmond's and Molyneux's arrivals in England, the nature of their respective emigrations, their outlooks and expectations as athletes reflect the evolution that was taking place in the American sports scene. Richmond came to London as a servant and stumbled into boxing. To Molyneux, boxing was his ticket to independence. He came to England as neither slave nor servant. He arrived in London with the single-minded mission of becoming world champion. Although it took place in England, the fight marked the dawn of the black presence in American sports. Fittingly, the black athlete's prototype was a man who'd won his freedom with his fist and who, not satisfied with mere physical freedom, became hungry for more. Race, as it would be for the next two centuries, was at the core of white society's resistance to Molyneux's rise. Pierce Egan, the best-known boxer writer of the era, wrote, quote, some persons feel alarmed at the bare idea that a black man and a foreigner should seize the championship of England and decorate his sable brow with the hard-earned laurels of crib. He must, however, have his fair chance. End quote. England had never seen a fight of this magnitude. Hundreds sloshed through the mud and gusting winds to bear witness to a match bursting with symbolism and metaphor. Englishman versus American, white versus black. Despite the rain and wind and generally dreary conditions, the afternoon had the feel of a coronation. And for many, that was precisely what they had hoped for, a formal installation of crib and by extension the English people as king of pugilism, protector of English virtue and conqueror of infidels. Nearly everyone gathered at Copthorne Commons had heard tales and rumors of the man the English press alternately dubbed the American Othello and the great American Moor. Rumor is one thing, seeing is something else. Here was Molyneux, broad shoulders, stout chest, muscles bulging from well-formed arms and legs. His dark brown skin struck a dramatic contrast to the sea of white faces surrounding the boxing ring that winter afternoon. The English press had framed the fight in a way that modern readers would find familiar. All the already well-formed stereotypes were in play here in the squared circle. The black man's questionable character and intellect versus the white man's claim to civilization and superiority. An ear-splitting roar erupted as Crib appeared and climbed on the scale for the weigh-in. He was the hardy, robust signature of England. The band blasted Heart of Oak in honor of Crib and Yankee Doodle Dandy in the American's honor. The anticipation for the fight was unprecedented, the pre-fight tension unbearable. Now the fighters stood shoulder to shoulder on the scales, Crib's white skin touching Molyneux's black skin. Molyneux was not intimidated. In fact, one journalist wrote that, quote, Molyneux was in the highest state of confidence. Indeed, his vaunting bordered upon insolent braggadocio, end quote. Egan, covering the fight, wrote, The affair excited the most extraordinary sensation, not only in the pugilistic world, but also among classes that had hitherto considered boxing as beneath their notice, and who now, thinking the honor of their country was at stake, took a most lively interest in the affair. The betting was heavier than had been known in years. Odds were laid that Molyneux would be defeated in 15 minutes, and it was considered the excess of foolhardiness in anyone who betted that he would stand more than half an hour. <laughs>
Indeed, few had given Molyneux a chance against Crib. He was supposed to have been the unsuspecting lamb being led to slaughter. The odds were five to one for Crib, ten to one that Molyneux would fall in fifteen minutes, and one hundred to one that he would not last the hour. Thirty minutes into the fight, however, the gamblers and nationalists, and most of all Tom Cribb, realized that they had made a tremendous miscalculation. They had grossly underestimated Molyneux's skill, his heart, his toughness, and stamina. Mostly, they had overlooked his resolve. Working deftly with a combination of quickness and power, Molyneux handed Cribb the most savage beating of his career. The left side of Cribb's face was grotesquely swollen, his nose and mouth a bloody, indistinguishable mass of flesh. In the 19th round, as Molyneux held Cribb in a headlock, riotous fans stormed the ring and pummeled the black fighter. Molyneux sustained a broken finger as rioters attempted to break his grip. By the 27th round, the fight crowd realized that unless something was done and quickly, the honor of England and hundreds of pounds would be lost. Bad enough that the national hero would lose, but lose to a Yankee? To a black man? What stunned these fans most was not Molyneux's power, but his finesse and strategic command of the ring. According to ancient stereotype, blacks supposedly lacked the intellectual capacity to be strategists as well as the fortitude to be warriors. These deep-seated stereotypes, along with Cribb's national standing, made Molyneux's performance all the more stunning. Molyneux proved himself as a courageous a man as ever an adversary contended with, Egan wrote. Molyneux astonished everyone that afternoon, not only with his extraordinary power and strength, but also by his acquaintance with their science which was far greater than anyone had given him credit for. In the 28th round, Molyneux inflicted so much punishment that Cribb, quote, could not come to in time, end quote. The champion could not get off his second knee to meet Molyneux in the center of the ring. The umpire, Sir Thomas Apriest, had allowed the half minute between rounds to elapse, then summoned each man three times. Cribb did not rise. Molyneux was ecstatic as he awaited his award of victory in the center of the ring. Sensing he had won, he leaped in the air in celebration. In that instance, the 26-year-old fighter embodied one of the most compelling themes in sports, one that the black athlete would revisit in various problematic iterations over time. The use of athletics as a way out, sports as a dramatic means of improving one's station in life, of gaining economic advantage and prestige that would have been impossible to achieve without sports. Two years earlier, Molyneux had been a slave on a Virginia plantation. Now he was on the verge of pulling off perhaps the greatest upset in boxing history. Egan described what Molyneux was still up against. The black had to contend against a prejudicial multitude. The pugilistic honor of the country was at stake, and the attempts of Molyneux were viewed with jealousy, envy, and disgust. The national laurels to be borne away by a foreigner, the mere idea to an English breast was afflicting, and the reality could not be endured. It should seem the spectators were ready to exclaim, Forbid it, heaven! Forbid it, man! In the midst of the excited confusion, and in clear violation of the rules, Cribb's handler, Joe Ward, rushed across the ring to Molyneux's trainer, Bill Richmond, and yelled, Foul! He accused Richmond of having placed two bullets in his fighter's hand. This charge, according to Paul Henning, covering the fight for the London Times, was indignantly denied and Molyneux was requested to open his hands, proving that nothing was there. The rules, however, succeeded and gave Cribb the opportunity to come around. All this drama swirled as the timekeeper repeatedly yelled, Time! Time! Signaling that the bout was over. Ultimately, the timekeeper, who was under considerable duress from a crowd that had already stormed the ring once, waved the rules 
Crib was allowed an additional two minutes to recover and resume the fight. The fight continued, but a dejected Molyneux began to fade. Twelve rounds later, Molyneux found his skull crashing against a ring post, his dream crumbling into ashes. In this, the 40th round, the black American fighter finally conceded defeat. Despite his loss to Crib, Molyneux became the toast of London. Aside from being a novelty, he earned respect of the English for his audacity, gall, and pluck. After the historic fight with Crib, Molyneux watched his fame, popularity, and notoriety grow to a level he could have barely imagined two years earlier as a slave on the plantation. Though he was raw and often crude, Molyneux found in England a kindred spirit. Each had battle scars. England had endured a succession of invasions, the Romans, the Danes, the Vikings, the Normans. At the time of the Molyneux crib fight, England was fighting France. There was the eternal war with Ireland, and friction with the United States would again lead to war in 1812. Molyneux had his scars as well, long ones across his back that were the signature of his previous life. In London, he enjoyed life and lived the life. Molyneux sat for a number of famous artists, including Douglas Guest, a frequent exhibitor at the Royal Academy, who included his portrait of Molyneux in his gallery. He also sat for the artists Molteno, Dighton, and Sharples. He was drawn in action during his fight with Cribb by Rowlandson and by the French painter Theodore Gericault. Everybody in England knew of Molyneux, Egan wrote. Through advertisement and published accounts, the name of this American-born Negro was a household word. The English press loved Molyneux because he made good copy. He had a fascinating story, after all, and was not bashful about telling it. Three days after his first fight with Cribb, Molyneux published his challenge for a rematch in an open letter to Cribb in the London newspapers. Pugilistic Challenge to Mr. Tom Cribb Sir, my friends think that had the weather on last Tuesday on which I contended with you not been so unfavorable, I should have won the battle. I therefore challenge you to a second meeting at any time within two months, to such a sum as those gentlemen who place confidence in me be pleased to arrange. As it is possible that this may meet the public eye, I cannot omit the opportunity of expressing a confident hope that the circumstances of my being of a different color to that of a people amongst whom I have sought protection will not in any way operate to my prejudice. I am, sir, your most obedient, humble servant, T. Molyneux. The second Crib Molyneux fight took place on September 28th, 1811 in Thistleton Gap, England, and created even more frenzy than the first. There was an almost hysterical air of fear and expectation at Thistleton Gap. Again, the national honor was at stake. Crib trained hard for the rematch. Molyneux, after his discouraging loss, began drinking heavily and carousing, and finally broke with Richmond. This was a significant break. Without his trainer's shrewd eye watching over him, Molyneux reportedly consumed a chicken and a quart of ale on the day of the fight. He fought six strong rounds until fatigue, lack of training, and the excesses of his social life took their toll. Finally, in round 11, with Molyneux's jaw broken, his face a bloody mess, Crib was declared the winner. Except for bits and pieces taken from the English papers, barely a word was written in the United States about Molyneux's exploits in London. The first history of prize fighting, published in the United States in 1849, failed even to mention Molyneux's name. A single story about his fight with Tom Tough Blake leading up to the first crib fight appeared in the October 25th, 1810 edition of the Raleigh, North Carolina, Minerva. The fact that Molyneux's feats in England were ignored reflects on one level the obscurity of boxing in the United States, 
More than that, however, the lack of acknowledgement reflects the suffocating impact of American slavery, an institution that refused to allow slaves and often their masters any news of the word that would suggest that black people had an alternative to bondage. They were certainly not going to be allowed to hear of a story that suggested that blacks could compete with whites on equal footing. American slavery was founded on the principle of benevolent authority, the notion that the white man knows what's best for the black man. The primary aim of slaveholders was to indoctrinate slaves with a deep sense of fear and inferiority, to make them accept the notion of white supremacy in all things. Heralding Molyneux's exploits in England might encourage black independence at a time when the grip of slavery and the persecution had intensified. By the time Molyneux arrived in England, the distinction in the United States between free blacks and slaves was being erased by whites, alarmed by the rising number of free blacks in the United States. By 1810, free blacks in the United States were finding it increasingly difficult to stay free. A white person could simply claim that a Negro was a slave and throw him back into bondage. There were numerous instances of kidnappings, and those cases that actually reached the law, the courts often reduced free Negroes to slavery or servitude. Making a living was also becoming more difficult. In Maryland, for example, free Negroes could not sell corn, wheat, or tobacco without a license. Several states required free Negroes to have a white guardian and all southern states required them to have passes. There were restrictions on travel. Malinu's home state, Virginia, barred free Negroes from entering its borders. There were also laws against free Negroes leaving the state for any length of time. Malinu came of age near the end of an era in African-American evolution that historian John Hope Franklin has called, quote, the search for independence. It was a time of first. Phyllis Wheatley, who, like Molyneux, was enslaved, published the first book of poems by a black woman in 1773. Benjamin Banneker published the first science book written by an African American in 1791. By the mid-1790s, Molyneux's future benefactor, Bill Richmond, had become the first black athlete to receive international acclaim. But now began a time when race relations and the perception of the African American permanently began to deteriorate in the United States. The Enlightenment idealism of the American Revolution, which led to widespread condemnation of the institution of slavery, was giving way to the calcification of racial categories. These categories helped define who belonged and who did not. The Naturalization Act of 1790 was designed to consolidate an American national identity as European immigrants were transformed through national legislation into free white persons. We also began to see the effort to define the African American slave as a, quote, living tool, property with a soul, end quote. Richmond stumbled into professional sports. Molyneux's distinction is that he actually set out to be a professional athlete and achieved prominence in the field. Molyneux was a pioneer in many ways, not least of which was in showing how the tools of enslavement could become the tools of liberation. The black experience in athletics is a prime example of this motif in African American life. But the irony is that sports, which would become the tool of liberation for Molyneux, and so many others, as well as a tool of psychological liberation for generations of black fans, were not introduced to empower enslaved blacks in antebellum America. Sports on the plantation were used as diversions to dull the revolutionary instinct. Many slaveholders felt that contests, such as the harvest festivals, an early American form of athletic games, were an ideal way for slaves to safely take out suppressed anger, aggression, and hostility. They felt that the competition dulled the revolutionary inclination. Frederick Douglass agreed. Douglass did not like fates and festivals, and was generally suspicious of sports. He saw holidays as frauds 
created not for the joy of laborers, but for the owners of that labor. Douglas felt that such festivals were only safety valves and conductors, quote, to carry off the explosive elements inseparable from the human mind when reduced to the condition of slavery. But for these, the rigors of bondage would have become too severe for endurance, and the slave would have been forced to dangerous desperation. Douglas added, To make a contented slave, you must make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and, as far as possible, to annihilate his power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. The man who takes his earnings must be able to convince him that he has a perfect right to do so. It must depend upon mere force. The slave must know no higher law than his master's will. The whole relationship must not only demonstrate to his mind its necessity, but its absolute rightfulness. In his autobiography, Douglas mentions the holidays at Christmas as a time when, quote, the sober-thinking, industrious ones would employ themselves in manufacturing. Douglas believed that southern plantation owners used those, quote, wild and low sports to keep blacks, quote, semi-civilized. Because Douglas wasn't an athlete, you could assume that he didn't particularly care for athletics. This is not entirely true. Douglas recognized the power of athletics to either pacify or inspire, and Douglas did enjoy competition. Shortly after the Civil War, he watched his youngest son, Charles, play baseball for the Washington Alerts. What Douglas despised was not sport, but rather white control of sports in which blacks were involved. He opposed the manipulation of black participation in sports to enhance a system that enslaved them. Douglas achieved his own liberation when, after months of torment, he confronted his overseer and fought him in a famously documented two-hour confrontation. Douglas called this fight the turning point in his career as a slave. Quote, it rekindled in my breast the smoldered embers of freedom and revived within me a sense of my own manhood. End quote. What Douglas didn't see about sports was that they often allow slaves to grasp the same sense of their own humanity and selfhood. Sports, for many of the enslaved men in particular, became a ritual of reclaiming one's manhood. For Douglas, the act of fighting, not the winning, was liberating. His liberation lay in having the courage to fight his oppressor. He translated the symbolism of confrontation in real terms. He fought a system of slavery, challenging it in a fundamental way by engaging his overseer in a life or death struggle. For many blacks, sports were similarly symbolic ways of physically transcending the system of bondage, a space for freedom. This legacy of using sports to take a symbolic claim to humanity has endured. Malanu facing Crib, Jack Johnson beating Jim Jeffries, Jackie Robinson facing white Major League Baseball, Muhammad Ali defying the United States government, even Latrell Sprewell, part of a black majority governed by a white minority, attacking his white coach, or more recently, black players attacking white fans. While each of these are, like Douglas's stories of violent confrontation, there's a crucial difference. While later athletes fought to be accepted, admired, and respected, Douglas fought to be free. For the early African Americans, alternatives to captivity were limited. They could commit suicide, as thousands did, or render themselves useless through physical mutilation, as other thousands did. They could attempt escape, as thousands tried, or they could attempt revolt and insurrection, which many did. The consequences of escape and revolt are recorded in the grisly accounts of slaves who were caught and subsequently flogged, or those implicated in insurrections who were brutally executed. 
the quote-unquote smart alternative taken by the vast majority of slaves was to embrace survival. In exchange for being allowed to live, slaves were forced to accept the terms and conditions of bondage, and they were assaulted by constant, often brutal reminders of their subordinate status. Plantation owners continually worked to instill in their slaves a feeling of inferiority and, conversely, a belief in the innate superiority of all whites. Africans brought into American slavery were forced to accede to the humiliation that relinquishing one selfhood demanded. They had to adhere to a set of elaborate laws, plantation rules, and social expectations. They could not possess alcohol without their master's permission, could not trade, traffic, or barter without a permit, could not beat drums or blow horns. They were not allowed to gamble with whites, to own property, to leave the plantation without a pass. They were not taught to read or write. Sports played a crucial role in the lives of Africans who were captured, sold, and placed aboard America-bound slave ships. Plantation games and recreation were critical to the physical and psychic survival of many slaves. Physical competition became another means of salvaging a portion of lost self-esteem. Games, play, became a way of accommodating a bizarre new reality of bondage. For slave children, so-called athletic feats were a source of great pride. The ability to perform well in physical contests usually guaranteed them the respect of their impressionable young playmates. There was no American sports culture to speak of in the mid-17th century. The high value placed on work, coupled with the scarcity of workers, made recreation virtually impossible. By the early part of the 18th century, however, African slaves had become an essential part of an evolving sports culture in the American South. A rising aristocracy began to use sports to increase and extend its power. In the process of accomplishing this, quarter-mile racing became prominent. This emerging elite had access to vast amounts of land as well as an increasingly prominent labor force, enslaved Africans. The presence of these African jockeys and trainers reinforced a distinctive view of labor and leisure that the elite embraced and quarter-mile racing represented. But there was a wider range of sporting activities in which African slaves were involved. In the plantation south, slaves of rival plantations were used as oarsmen in high-stakes boat races as their respective masters steered. Foot racing an enormously popular sport in the United States during the 1830s was equally popular on the plantations and provided a convenient backdrop for wagering. Plantation owners exploited the speed of the fastest slaves by entering them into races against neighboring slaves or local challengers in various town races. Some slave owners formally trained slaves and even held preliminary races to ensure that only the fastest runners would race. One slave recalled the running of races on his plantation. It was a custom in those days for one plantation owner to match his nigger against that of his neighbor. Paris trained his runners by having them race to the boundary of his plantation and back again. He would reward the winner with a jackknife or a bag of marbles. Just to be first was an honor in itself, for the fastest runners from all over the country competed for top honors and the winner represented his master in the 4th of July races. When runners from all over the area competed for top honors and the winner earned a bag of silver for his master. Another slave, William Mallory of Virginia, recalled the number of races he ran for his owner and proudly declared that he had never been defeated. Mallory added a touch of braggadocio by saying that he was so fast that at the Civil War Battle of Bull Run, he added to his legend for blistering speed when, quote, I actually outran the bullets. End quote. Planters describe the characteristics of runaway slaves in terms of their physical acumen. This ad for a runaway slave in the August 3, 1797 edition of the Maryland Gazette acknowledges that slaves had made owners aware of their great speed. To any person apprehending and delivering at this place, Negro Isaac, who left here yesterday morning and is endeavoring to cross the bay, his route will be to the Delaware State or Philadelphia. Though a very timid fellow, it will be difficult to apprehend him, 
as he runs remarkably fast. He is a noted rogue, runaway, and horse rider. Slave narratives make frequent reference to adult slaves wrestling and fighting each other. Slaves prefer to compete among themselves and settle scores in private. The idea of competing for the entertainment of owners was the owner's idea. In his dissertation on plantation games, David Wiggins writes, It was common for planters to pit individual slaves against each other in wrestling and boxing matches. They frequently took place after corn shuckings, log rollings, or other communal gatherings when slaves from all over were gathered at one particular plantation. Slaveholders like nothing better than placing a wager or two on their favorite combatant. John Finley, a former slave from Alabama, reinforced the idea that these black-on-black -black fights were the white planter's idea. Quote, The nigger fights and more for the white folks' enjoyment, but the slaves am allowed to see it. The masses of plantation match their niggers caught in the size and bet on them. End quote. Sports, like dance and musical forms, become tools of survival. But even as the power behind competitions was white, the slaves seized their own meaning from them. Athletic competition became a mode of expression and transformation. Quote, the slaves' uncommon manner of performing many of their sports and popular pastimes was in a sense a form of communication. Wiggins notes, by utilizing different styles and assuming different roles in physical activities, slaves were able to express their deepest fears and anxieties, scorn the maladroit whites, and convey their thoughts and feelings to fellow bondsmen. End quote. In play, the slave could become master, the powerless could become powerful, athletic competition or a mere athletic feat, lifting hogs' heads, picking cotton, cutting cane was a free space where bodies bound and scarred by chains could soar. Sporting events sometimes provided slave children with an opportunity to compete against the children of plantation owners or overseers. These innocent appearing competitions were often more significant to Africans because the white man's games were an extension of the white man. A victory wasn't simply a victory, but often a moral triumph over Pharaoh, a step toward the promised land. In one narrative, Felix Haywood of Texas told an interviewer, quote, we were stronger and knowed how to play and the white children didn't, end quote. Another young slave who lived on a plantation in West Virginia regarded the son of the plantation master as his friend, but didn't allow him to win at any of their games. This particular young slave believed that he had an unusual strength and spirit and claimed that he was, quote, the best of the young boys on the plantation. End quote. Even Frederick Douglass, who frequently criticized the role of sports played in dulling the angry edge of slaves, remarked with pride that black boys, quote, could run as fast, jump as far, throw the ball as direct and true, and catch it with as much dexterity and skill as the white boys. End quote. What slaves could not do was give a defining voice to who they were. Slavery dramatically repressed the ability of slaves to express themselves. Even to attempt such a thing would be to risk being called impudent, which could lead to severe punishment. Impudence could lead to death. The range of self-expression was curtailed to an extent that is difficult to imagine. Slaves were whipped for sullen disposition or dogged countenance. A slave must not manifest feelings of resentment. For slaves, then sport and play, music, dance, gestures, and other forms of nonverbal communication became crucial outlets for expression and communication. Sports were transformational. Play gave slaves a measure of autonomy, which in turn provided a forum for actions and expression that, in other contexts, might be seen by authority figures as arrogance or impudence. In addition to sports, there were a number of ways that slaves with unique skills could be elevated beyond the drudgery of backbreaking field work. Slaves who practiced medicine were highly valued for their ability to cure illness. Slaves with a facility for numbers were also valued. 
and wealthier plantation owners used slaves as blacksmiths, carpenters, stonemasons, millers, and shoemakers. But for many plantation owners, whose estates were often physically isolated and at great distances from each other, the slaves' greatest value was their capacity to provide entertainment. The plantation owners relied on slaves singing and dancing for their entertainment and the entertainment of their guests. A slave who was an accomplished fiddler was in great demand at social gatherings, as were quote-unquote callers who used clever rhymes to provide stepping instructions for country dances. Playing at social gatherings and later engaging in athletic feats and contests earned privileges slaves would not have otherwise had. Tom Molyneux's significance is that he identified the possibility of sports as another way of achieving liberty. He presaged what would become a dominant avenue after slavery. By the middle of the 19th century, sports generally became a way to help young men, black and white, but disproportionately black, escape from poverty. The plantation athlete assumed a prestigious, though ambiguous, status within the plantation hierarchy. There were two status systems at work on the plantation, one defined by owners and staff, and one by the slave community. Blacks who were carriage drivers, cooks, maids, and slave drivers had high status among the white community, but very low status within the slave community. They were distrusted. Nat Turner specifically told fellow rebels not to tell house servants about an impending revolt, with good reason. When someone informed the servants, the plan was foiled. Within the slave community, people like the granny woman who cared for the community of slave children or the conjure man had high status. Quote, the person who couldn't be broken, the rebel, the one they'd whip and whip and he'd still come up fighting. That person had high status in the slave community and none at all in the white planter family. End quote. Ann Patton Malone a professor of history at Louisiana Tech University and the author of Slave Family and Household Structure in 19th Century Louisiana. There were figures who earned special status from both the plantation owners and the slave community. An accomplished athlete was one such person. According to Malone, the slave athlete, the fighter, the jockey, the horse trainer, often enjoyed exalted status among fellow slaves and was regarded as a role model for slave children to whom he passed along his various skills. The most talented enslaved athletes not only earned respect among fellow slaves but also garnered favor among owners who saw their prowess as an outward extension of the owner's own strength. For those in bondage, the image of the strong black body engaged in competition was a positive one and a powerful symbol. The black athlete's strength and grace presented a powerful counter-image to the prevailing stereotypes of blacks as slump-shouldered, shuffling bondsmen with heads bowed and knees bent. Athletic contest and the social gatherings surrounding them helped slaves maintain their identity as individuals and secure their cohesion as much as possible as a community. This was critical for slaves brought to North America, where extreme measures were taken to split tribal groups, clans, and families so that little community of belief or practice remained. Festivals and races helped keep this community intact, however, fostering group solidarity and community spirit. Play taught crucial survival skills. The games of children in bondage often reflected an astute awareness that they lived a fragile existence under circumstances that required a certain level of cooperation, cohesion, and compassion. While some references to boxing and wrestling appear in slave narratives, the children generally preferred to engage in, quote, more gentle pursuits. In his dissertation, Sports and Popular Pastimes on the Plantation, David Wiggins points out that physical abuse of one child by another was considered unjustifiable and a veritable threat to the general well-being of the group. Like their parents, 
Slave children viewed themselves as a distinct body with common concerns, problems, and lifestyles. They recognized the need to remain together as a familial group, no matter the particular circumstances. The point is not that slave children never fought each other, but rather they understood it was to their mutual advantage to care for each other and refrain as much as possible from foolish skirmishes. Children were usually so attuned to their interdependence that they often refrained from playing games that required the elimination of players. Even in a game like dodgeball, which typically required that a player who was hit sat on the side, rules were altered to allow players to remain in the game. The reluctance to eliminate reflected an underlying fear of having a father, mother, sister, or brother sold or hired out at any time. Play was an area that slave children could regulate, where they could ensure that their playmates would not suddenly be removed from their midst. Child and adult slaves alike learned that survival required teamwork. Yet, by the beginning of the 21st century, white sports journalism had created and fostered and perpetuated the stereotype of black athletes as selfish individual players with an incessant one-on-one -on -one mentality. In fact, the history of African-American survival in the United States is the history of teamwork and a history of individual expression within the context of the larger group. Teamwork and community represented an essential component of African-American survival. This was reflected in their games and social gatherings. The most poignant example of how African Americans in bondage used events as a means of maintaining continuity were the harvest festivals that celebrated the earth's abundance and the techniques of producing food. These included cotton picking, hog killing, and log rolling. These activities provided a test of skills and allowed individual slaves to distinguish themselves within the group. The most significant activity was corn shucking, the process by which corn is plucked from the stalk, husked, and stored for the winter. The festival itself was modeled after traditional English celebrations and took place in autumn. Depending on the planter's resources, the festivals could be huge affairs, with slaves from other plantations joining in. Corn shucking festivals were held throughout the United States. In the South, however, the agricultural festivals were used by plantation owners as a way of, quote, authorizing the delegation of power attending the ownership of the land and the slaves, end quote. These festivals were not the democratic drama of the frontier bee in the North. In the South, work parties on the plantation involved a bringing together of workers who were not landowners but slaves. Yet, these very congregations made some plantation owners uncomfortable. Some planters view the coalescing of slaves into groups for team activities as potentially dangerous and actively discouraged it. In fact, in 1797, the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, passed a law prohibiting African Americans from playing, quote, baseball on Sundays. This early history of the African in America offers a first glimpse of the differences in sporting culture between African Americans and European Americans. For all the talk and reality of contemporary social integration and assimilation, there remains a distinct black-white aesthetic divide in United States mainstream sports. Even as more young white athletes become influenced by urban black mannerisms, there is a fundamental, if subtle, tension between their respective approaches to sport. The tension is an extension of age-old, deeply rooted differences in what sports have meant to survival. Practically from the beginning of their coexistence in the New World, Africans and Europeans, especially the English, viewed sports through drastically different lenses. Much of this had to do with the respective sporting traditions they brought with them to the New World. In England, beginning early in the 17th century, 
there was a court-inspired assault on the recreations of laborers, servants, and tradesmen. Reformist critics across England saw that when sports contests and public displays of physical prowess competed with religion, sports won. In response, justices of the peace in places like Lancashire mandated church attendance and suggested that sporting activities be banned. The tension went back to the previous century when officials in certain towns eliminated football matches and other events from the list of acceptable Sunday activities. Eventually, in 1617, the conflicts led to a compromise called the Declaration of Sports, which ensured the sanctity of the Sabbath morning church services and the acceptance of sports and recreation later in the day. But the declaration fell in and out of use and became a bloody bone of contention between the clergy and the sports-addicted public. For what sports actually expressed was the response to fundamental changes in England from manors, lords, and tenants toward industrialization and urbanization. Yet, in spite of the power structure's ambivalence, activities like wrestling, football, soccer, horse racing, and cockfighting remained staples of English sportive life. Sub-Saharan non-Muslim Africans had a strong athletic tradition as well. What Westerners called quote-unquote sport was to these Africans an integral part of their ritual, spiritual, and community life. The games were as diverse as the continent itself. The men participated in a variety of games, including foot and oxen races. Women played an assortment of games too, often using a ball and various throwing and catching techniques. For males or females, a central characteristic of all games was the use of dancing, either as a means of introducing the game or as an integral part of playing it. And great care was taken to distinguish dances that were intended for secular uses from those designed to honor the deities. The differences between the European, English, and African view of sport carried over to the New World and widened with the advent of slavery, which created an artificial distinction in which Europeans assumed a superior position, while Africans and their progeny assumed a subordinate position based purely on race. White planters judged an individual's worthiness by the type of work he performed. While planters saw their own recreational pursuits, horse racing, boat racing, as signatures of elite and refined society, they considered play as trifling, frivolous, and inconsequential to survival. For slaves, work did not define who they were because it reaped more benefits for the slave owner than for the worker. The realm of play, which might include work, or the way one went about work, was a free space where the slave could salvage dignity, affirm selfhood, and express flair and individuality. Sports, as well as dance and music, were vehicles through which transcendence and transformation could be achieved, in which the slave could be master. The powerless could become powerful. Indeed, in the late 19th century, black boxers, black baseball players, and even a smattering of black football players were flourishing. Black jockeys were legends, money earners, in the emerging business of horse racing. This physical presence in sport was a testimony in some minds to African Americans' ability to survive and flourish. Their hardy physical presence prompted Theodore Roosevelt to remark, Quote, the Negro, unlike so many of the inferior races, does not dwindle in the presence of the white man. He holds his own. Indeed, under the condition of American slavery, he increased faster than the whites, threatening to supplant him. End quote. Three years later, in the midst of withering brutality directed at African Americans, Jack Johnson became the first black man to win what was regarded as the American white man's prize of prizes. Johnson won the heavyweight championship of boxing. 
This was the dawn of the American century and of an emerging black presence in sports. In 1910, a century after Tom Molyneux was robbed of his rightful victory over Tom Cribb in London, Jack Johnson put his knuckled stamp on the forehead of American sports by defending his title against the favorite Jim Jeffries, who carried with him into the ring that afternoon the prophetic label, The Great White Hope. The hysteria over this black rise in sports betrayed a deep-seated fear among whites of being overtaken by African Americans. This fear triggered a mostly unconscious knee-jerk reaction to black success by mainstream white society. Changing rules and changing relationships to either eliminate or mute the black presence, whether by gentlemen's agreement, racial quotas, or globalization. As scholar and sports historian Gerald Early observed in an interview with me for the 1996 HBO documentary, Journey of the African American Athlete, quote, At this point, white society had decided it was going to use any method it could to bring him down. He was just completely a political figure at this point, and it was decided that they were going to bring him down, end quote. Just as Molyneux was robbed in the ring, so black athletes across the board have been faced with ever-changing rules designed to maintain white dominance. Mostly, this has meant using power to change the rules of engagement. This is the quote-unquote jockey syndrome. 